Okay, I want to welcome oh, everyone Jesus. to our um, welcome everybody to the Western Cuyahoga Audubon I have to speaker up. series. This is the January fourth, and it's going to be our first meeting for the for the for the year twenty twenty two. Welcome and happy New Year, everybody. Is anybody out there new to our group? Who's never been here before? No, welcome, welcome everybody. Who's I see lots of names. I see I, I look as familiar as you know the Chaucers and Tim Colburn. Hi there, everybody. Michelle. I see some 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 new names that are new to, to me. Gloria Bando, welcome. Thank you. For Hi. Coming. Thank you. Pardon me. There you go. Hi. Hi. Nancy Valenti. Hi there. How are you? Heather, how are you? Okay. Doing well. So, good. Um, let's see here. The, we, our meeting is, is starting now and our speaker will start about eight o'clock and it's gonna be Judy Semrock. So we are looking forward to hearing her. So next, next, next slide, Michelle. Michelle is our co-host and, and I'm, the, I'm one of the board members. So is Michelle, Michelle Brocius. She's manning the technology here for us. Next slide. Okay, welcome everybody. We are, uh, we, we hope that some many of you will join as memberships if you haven't already done so. Um, the 2021 Christmas bird count wrap up it will occur next, is it next Monday, Michelle? I don't know, I think there's another slide about that. And we're gonna talk about the spring bird walks too today. So they're coming up. We're gonna go back, why, yippee. Um, next slide. Okay. okay, memberships. So if you haven't joined Western Cuyahoga Audubon, we really hope that you will. We have wonderful programs. We have wonderful field trips. Um, our memberships start at $20 for a student, $40 for individuals, $55 for a family, $150 for business, and $300 for sustaining members. We'll be a benefactor, we'll give us $750. Um, you can make you can make your check. You can make your payments either through PayPal on our website or by check. And the bottom in there, there's a link there that you can click on. That um, we can put that into the chat. Would you could you do that for us, Michelle? Could you put that uh, link on our chat so that in case anybody wants to join tonight? Of course. And after you've had a chance to do that. Liz, could you, or not Liz, um, Michelle, would you mind giving us the next slide? There we go. Okay, mark your calendars. Here's go. The, the, everybody who participated in the Christmas bird count, or even those who have not, anybody can join. We have a, back one slide. Um, we always have a fun wrap up. At least this is our, our second year for doing this virtually. We have a fun wrap up on a Zoom, which, if you, um, the Zoom link is here on the screen. People who have already participated in the, the Christmas bird count will get a, a link via email from Nancy saying to join on um, January, which is next Monday uh, at seven o'clock. And she's gonna go over the checklist and review photos that people have sent in. And we can tell stories about what happened on the day of the Christmas bird count. So please, feel free to join. And if you want to join, even if you haven't, um, there's, I, I believe there's a, it's going to be on Eventbrite, isn't it, Michelle? Do you know? And if not, send a, send an email to info at Kirtland Bird Club, not Kirtland, excuse me. Send an email to info at wcaudubon.org and ask them if, you know, ask us if we can send you a, a link to the uh, Christmas bird count wrap up, and we will do that. Next slide. Okay, and our spring bird counts. Remember those? 
they've been kind of on hold for a couple of years, but we're going to go back to them. And the, the they start the second Sunday in April. And they, they last for the last three Sundays in April, plus the first three Sundays in May. And they start at 730 at various locations around Cuyahoga and Geauga and Lake and Medina counties. The two walk areas that Western Cuyahoga Audubon supports or sponsors are the Lake, Lake Isaac area and the Big Creek Reservation area. Um, yeah, the Lake Isaac, which is in Big Creek, and then the Rocky River Nature Center. They're, they're great bird walks, spot, and they have great leaders there. Lake Isaac has got Lancy Howell and Rich Kasouf, and then Rocky River is, um, the leaders are Dave Grasskemper and Bill Deininger, Ken Gober, and I believe there's another person whose name I can't remember. Um, we always are looking for them, the spring migrants as they come in. Early in the spring season, we end up with um, you know the, the the good little birds like what are, what are some of the birds that you see in the early spring bird walks? People, let us know. You can turn on your turn on your uh, audio if you want. Just chime in here a little bit and let us know which which what are the early bird birds that we see on those walks? Anybody? Come on, be brave. Talk. Dwight? The wait is over. Phoebe. The final chapter. Phoebe, good, good. And the past promises all the Phoebe's are always, always a good new one. Have you eyed anything on set that you might want to keep as a memento? And maybe we'll see some owls too during the early ones. Maybe they might be still nesting. Of course, the main ones always got to have the, the warblers that we're always looking forward to. And then let's see, and everybody is encouraged to come. You can be novice or experienced birders. Everybody's welcome. So, next slide. And, and, um, and so I will, I'll keep in touch. Okay. Our next speaker well, for the moment here is Michelle. She's going to talk about field trips. Take it away, oh. Michelle. Thank you. Hi, everyone. And uh, before I get started, I would like to just request that if you um, have taken yourself off mute to speak, please put yourself back on mute so that we can eliminate distracting background noise throughout the session. Um, so I am going to talk about the second Saturday bird walks and I give you the report from the, the December bird walk, our virtual field trips, our Tremont towpath trail bird walks that are starting up again, um, and then how you can connect with us on social media. All right, so please join us on January 8th at 9 a.m at the Rocky River Nature Center parking lot for our second Saturday bird walk. We meet at this location and time every second Saturday of the month, usually between the upper and lower parking lots. And then we take a few hours to walk the Nature Center trails. Bill Dunninger, Dave Grasskemper, and Ken Gober are our leaders for the walk. And uh, the Kirtland Bird Club will be joining us this month. So we will extend to them a warm welcome on our January bird walk. All right, so uh, this past second Saturday was held on December 11th. Uh, please put yourself yeah, on mute. Like somebody injected that stuff in their lips. I did this. All right, I muted them. <laughs> All right, um, excuse me, everyone. All right, this past second Saturday was held on December 11th, and here is Bill Dininger's report. He says, uh, the December 2021 second Saturday bird walk started at 9 a.m. with temperatures um, a spring like 60 degrees. The walk ended with the same 60 degree temperature and unusually warm December walk. We had a mix of clouds, sun, and a little light rain. We tallied 26 species. The expected suspects were found on the three hour and 20 minute walk. Highlights were numerous with nice looks at a pair of pileated woodpeckers. We had three brown creepers. There were at least eight Carolina wrens calling and crawling in the brush. Two barred owls were seen in two different locations. Uh, the best highlight for the day and for the year was a red-tailed hawk. The red-tailed hawk was perched on a tree branch. And um, as the group approached, the hawk dove on the ground. The hawk then flew onto a log on the ground and it had a vole in its talon. It looked around and then proceeded to fly directly at the group with the vole hanging from its beak. It landed very close to the group on an unobstructed branch and proceeded to consume the vole. We all had incredible unobstructed long looks at the hawk. And I've included a picture of it 
um, right there on the slide. All right, so um, the December virtual field trip report. So last month, our virtual field trip was held at Euclid Creek Reservation. Our target species were the Belted Kingfisher and Mergansers. Uh, the virtual meetup during which I will present the scrapbook of everyone's photos, journaling, and bird lists takes place on the second Wednesday of the month which means it will be taking place on January 12th at 7 p.m. If you visited the location and have something to submit to me, please do so by this Friday so that I can get your items into the scrapbook. Even if you didn't have a chance to visit the reservation last month, you are still more than welcome to attend the virtual meetup in which I will share the scrapbook for discussion. All right, so this month, the virtual field trip takes place at West Creek Reservation in search of hawks and eastern bluebirds. It is easier to spot hawks and all birds really when the trees have dropped their leaves. Also, be sure to check the skies for these soaring birds of prey. Unless daylight means they will be more aggressively hunting. Also, bluebirds should pop against the winter's brown and white scenery. During your visit to the reservation, I encourage you to do any of the following activities. Take photographs, draw a picture, or create art inspired by what you've seen. Tally identified species or journal your experience. Send your items to me and your contribution will be published to a digital scrapbook and shared on our website and on social media. We will also have an optional virtual meetup to share our experiences and take a look at the scrapbook. You can get more information and register for this virtual field trip by visiting our website, wcautobahn.org and clicking the field trips tile and then field trip reports 2022. All right, after a brief pause, the Tremont Towpath Trail Bird Walks are back on the schedule. Uh, we meet the fourth Saturday of each month through October um, starting at 9 a.m. at the Cleveland Metro Parks Towpath parking lot off of Abbey Avenue. Um, it is an easy walk in an urban setting. And then finally, uh, please stay connected with us in between our virtual and in-person activities by following us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Be sure to use hashtag WC Audubon when you post a bird photo on Instagram for a chance to be featured on our Instagram page. If selected, I will reach out to you with details. Also, many of our virtual programs are recorded like the speaker series meeting and our virtual field trips that I mentioned and can be found on our WC Audubon YouTube channel. So please be sure to subscribe. All right, and that's it for me. Thank you, everyone. Okay, we can go to the next slide then. All righty. Um, we also have a book discussion group and the, um, the, the themes for them, the, the themes for our, our book discussion are usually birding and conservation, or nonfiction or historical fiction. Our host is Drina Nims, who currently is on a birding trip out in California, I believe. So, but she'll be back in time for the book discussion. Next slide. So our book discussion group, we're going to be discussing Silent Spring. The meeting will be January the 25th from 7 to 8 o'clock. And you can register at the w, for the WCAS Zoom. And here is the registration. So please get please do that. And if you need the book, you can, you can get it at Amazon or go to your local bookstore. Next slide. And this is just a, a picture of uh, Rachel Carson. She, her focus on in, in her endeavors were always on the, the use of pesticides with, um, that, with how it destroyed life and resistance, uh, how it re destroys life, res resistance develops. I'm not sure what that means anyway. Um, but she, she was, she was an excellent author, and most of she devoted her whole her whole career to being in the science and government and and doing the uh, trying to support the environment. So, next slide. And our in the next next uh, the next book club meeting will after will be in April, and they're going to talk about the feather thief. So, please consider reading those books and joining our book club. Next slide. Okay, next we're gonna, oh, no, first of all, we have, um, we've been selling soil from the rest, composted soil from the rest belt writers. And we have some bags that are available. 
So we're hoping that you can, you will start wanting to maybe start, start your early plantings for your, your house soil. We have some house soil, um, soil for your house plants, or your, if you want to start your garden now. And we have soil available. So please visit our homepage and you can purchase them and it will be delivered within a matter of days. Thank you. Next slide. Oh, and then there's our Mitchell's ice cream. Mitchell's ice cream uh, fundraiser. And we have, we still have some donation cards or not donation cards, $10 denomination cards that if you purchase $10 donation uh, denominations, they, you can buy, go buy your, your ice cream at Mitchell's. And it's a good thing for, it's a good gift for a Valentine's day. So please consider that. Here's our link for the WCAS store. So please do that. Next slide. Amanda. Amanda is our new coffee coordinator. And we're gonna let her take over here now and, and let you know what, she, what she's up to. Amanda, wanna unmute and... Okay, sorry, I was muted. Okay. <laughs> um, next slide, please. Um, we're selling um, birds and beans um, coffee that's triply certified. It's organic. It's fair trade, which means the growers make a living wage. And it's uh, Smithsonian certified bird friendly, which means it's where it's grown in Latin America. It, um, the growers grow uh, in the, underneath the canopy of native trees. And the good thing about this is it provides uh, habitat for um, the, the animals and it keeps from uh, burning all the um, native vegetation for the coffee plantations that really ruin uh, the environment. Um, so it's, it's really triply good. Um, it is also um, a fundraiser for uh, WCAS. We get about 5% back. So you're doing a lot of good when you're drinking actually really good coffee. Um, you can go to our website in the store that you can see the link there on the bottom. And uh, you need to have your orders in by January, or by the, the 10th of every month. Um, and then we put the orders in on the 11th. Um, there's all different grinds, all different blends. Um, you can even get whole beans. Um, and that reminds me that we have three bags, they're five pound bags of whole beans available for immediate delivery. So it, it's even um, two or three dollars cheaper than if you just bought it bought it new. It's some coffee that we had had from our last um, fundraiser. So if you order it, you'll have it within a day or two. Um, okay, that's all I have to say. So I hope that everyone will buy some of the coffee and help uh, uh, support our mission. Next. Okay. okay. Um, our, our member meeting next month will be a bird's eye view, the sensory world of birds by Dr. Sarah Maybe, and she's a professor at Hiram College. She's always a terrific speaker. So we look forward to seeing you again next month at 7.30 on February 1st. Next slide. And then today's speaker is Judy Semrock. She's terrific. She's been, she's been giving speeches forever around here. And she's always giving a ter terrific program. Tonight's program is Hiding in Plain Sight, Amazing Camouflage, Mimicry, and Evasion in Nature. Next slide. Or is this one where we share, start sharing with Judy? Okay, so Judy, are you there? I am here. Okay, so Judy, once you start sharing, the screen. How do you want? How do you want us to handle questions? Do you want us to 
give you, uh, wait until the very end, or do you want us to do them in between? Or just put them in chat? Okay, whatever is easiest, they can put them in the chat if someone could maybe read them or if there's something that's specific to a certain slide and you wanna cut in, that would be fine as well. Um, so you let me know if that happens along the way and we can address that question at that time. Okay, well, Michelle and I will keep eyes on the chat. At least I'll, I'll try my best to do that. As for anybody cutting in, that's up to you. Thank you. Okay, so um, this talk is going to show a lot of different things, but hopefully you can see in this first slide that there is a barred owl off to the left, but the idea is to show how the patterning and everything is part of how they can somewhat stay, stay concealed for various reasons, and we'll talk more about that. But let's make it a little more difficult. Let's move to the next one and think about or see what you can see in there. And hopefully you are seeing this great horned owl. Wow. So again, think about if, especially if you are an owl, uh, you want to stay away from things that are going to mob you, blue jays, crows, chickadees, titmice. And remember that your, your eye structure is stuff is such that you would like to be in the more darker areas because that's, you know, the, the bright sunlight is not the best for you. So again, during the day, they, they choose to hide or they choose to find darker areas in which to roost. So having tangles, things like that is very important to them. Uh, and again, so that's part of the camouflage. Evasion is when we have things that will hide to avoid being seen by their predators. Uh, so camouflage plays into that, but evasion can play into that as well. So this is one of our, our damselflies, our river jewel wing, that is, you could see the little creatures below that blade of grass that it is sitting on. And of course, if you're a dragonfly or a damselfly, you don't eat anything that's dead and you don't eat anything pretty much that's not moving. So you are attracted by things that do move so that you can you know, reach out and catch them and then eat them. So evasion is part of this whole um, arrangement of how things work in nature. The next part is going to be, that we'll talk about will be trickery, where both plants and animals use a form of trickery to keep from getting eaten or to allow them to gather their food. And we'll talk more about that as well. And then mimicry. And there are several types of mimicry and, and we'll get into that in more detail. But we have, here are three different insect species that again, look very similar because they are black and yellow. But again, there's a lot of difference between them, but for something that might be hunting them and just sees the black and, white, black and yellow coloration, they either tend to not go after them because for example, they might look like a yellow jacket uh, so part of their coloration and the mimicry that they are using helps them to survive for a variety of different species. So let's talk about, so that we're all on the same page, camouflage or crypsis is the ability to blend with the surrounding environment by masking coloration, noise, patterns, and even smell. Evasion is the act of escaping or avoiding to ward off predation. Trickery is the use of strategies to attract prey or deceive predators. And then mimicry is the resemblance of one creature, which is the mimic, to another creature, which is the model, so that a third observer, a possible predator, is deceived. And the three main types of mimicry are Batesian, Malarian, and Wasmanian, but we're gonna mainly focus on Batesian and Malarian in this talk. So, from the beginning of how you view something in nature, think of the food web. So if you're down near the bottom of the food web, there's a lot of things that can eat you. So they, do they see you from above? Do they see you from below? Do they see you from a lateral view? So a lot of the way that things are, the way that they look or the places where they hide have a lot to do with the type of predators that can feed upon them. So think of it in terms of, when you see something that looks odd or different, 
think about that in terms of who can feed on them and then how they view them in order to feed on them. So for example, here we have three different butterflies, the Eastern comma, the question mark, and the gray comma. When their wings are closed, which is usually when they are feeding, then the underside tends to look like tree bark because they can be sap eaters, they could be, uh, or fluid eaters, let's say. So when they are viewed with their wings closed, it's far more difficult to see them than if you view them with their wings open, because as you can see in the lower photos, those species with their wings open, all are very orange looking. But with their wings closed, you can see this question mark that's, that's nectaring on a pawpaw flower. Here's a gray comma that's actually uh, on the ground, near the ground, but there was sap near it from a cut in a tree, in tree bark that it was feeding on. And then over here, the Eastern comma that's feeding, uh, because again, remember as these species overwinter as adults, they can come out very early in the spring or even on a warm day in the winter. So part of the way that they are colored is in order to keep them from being predated upon. So here we, we get into another, the wings open, wings closed with some of our moths. And then you could see here the polyphemus in the upper left. And when the, when the wings are closed and you're seeing the underside, it really looks vastly different than when the wings are open and you see them from the upper side. Same thing with our tulip tree silk moth. Again, when the wings are closed, you're seeing somewhat of the arrangement of the eye spots. And we're gonna talk more about the eye spots later. But again, when the wings are closed and they're up against tree bark, they can be a lot harder to see. And remember, if you're a bird, uh, wings aren't particularly uh, of interest to you. So really what the bird is looking for is the body because in the silk moths, especially the head, the thorax and the abdomen are very thick and, and, and big. So that's a good food source. Some of the other butterflies and moths, the, the body part is much thinner, but in the silk moths, this is quite a prize for a bird to you know, capture one of these or a bat for that matter as well. So let's get into talking about Lepidoptera. So that's butterflies and moths. And we're gonna talk about cocoons, chrysalises and shelters. So this first shot, hopefully if you look at it, you can see that this is a spice bush, but what else are you seeing? You are seeing three different cocoons of the Promethea moth. And when you look at them more closely, you will see that basically it looks like a curled up leaf. The white part that you see is part of the silk that the moth uses to attach the cocoon to the, to the actual structure of the shrub or the tree. And by looking like a dead leaf, you tend to not be recognized as a potential food source. Now keep in mind in the winter time or early spring when there's no leaves on the trees, this becomes a food source, especially for woodpeckers. So they're able to actually slice through the silk that the moth has used to make their, make their cocoon. And there's others, you know, all of those silk moths make a similar type of cocoon, but they, they look different. They may be in different places, but again, by looking like a dead leaf or a cluster of dead leaves, that helps you to not get eaten. And when that Promethea moth hatches out, you can see that here is that cocoon that it came out of. Usually what happens is the hole opens at the bottom and it's able to crawl out. Its wings will be all folded up and really tightly compacted inside that cocoon. But as the fluid in the abdomen then leaches basically into the venation of the wings, then those wings are able to spread out so that they are able to fly after the wings dry. So. The underside of the wing looks like the picture on the left. The upper side of the wing looks like the picture on the right. And of course, male and female look different. And here's the caterpillar in this lower right picture. Very interesting looking with a lot of really cool little knobby colors and things on them. Let's get into our chrysalises. Hopefully you can potentially spot 
what might be in this photo. Let's get a little more definition to it. And if you can see the green oval, that is showing you a monarch chrysalis almost ready to hatch out, hence the fact that it is dark in color. When our monarch caterpillar goes into the J formation, it uses silk from its body to make a little attachment point where the tail end of the caterpillar basically is attached to some sort of structure. Most times it is something of a woody nature. And when the chrysalis is first made, it's sort of a lime, a lime green. It's got this little ridge along the edge that is the going to become the breaking point of when the chrysalis opens. And then as the chrysalis gets further along, you can actually see when it gets ready to hatch out, you can actually see the wings and the coloration of the wings in the chrysalis. And again, along this horizontal line, this is one of the split areas where it opens to split to allow the um, monarch butterfly to hatch out. And then the picture on the right shows you a pair, a mating pair. Let's go into shelters. So this is really a very cool thing that the red spotted purple butterfly does. It makes a shelter in order not to be eaten because it overwinters as a caterpillar. So it particularly likes willows. So what happens is this is a tiny little caterpillar. It's about the size of maybe a grain of rice. Okay, and what it does is it first attaches this leaf to the stem by using silk from its body. And then it cuts this arrangement out of the leaf. And you could see it here even better. It's almost a mirror image. It has the same little flange up here and the same little flange down here. It lays its body in along the midline of the leaf. And once it's done totally stitching everything together, it ends up looking like this, the lower left photo. Now you can see it sort of looks like a tube, but actually what that is, is that is the dead leaf. So in the winter, it'll just look like a dead leaf that is hanging from the end of a willow. And here's the picture here in the middle is showing you what it looks like on a willow branch that was far above my head. But knowing that this is a red spotted purple caterpillar that's hiding in there, the caterpillar is in this section that you see on the left. And let's go to the next shot. And here's what it looks like. So if you were to cut this open, this is what's hiding in there. So the actual caterpillar overwinters as a caterpillar so that in the spring, when the leaves start to emerge on the willow, it leaves this shelter and can start feeding on the young willow leaves, which is the best and most uh, delicate and most favored by these caterpillars. So when you're out and about and you're on your uh, bird walks that were advertised earlier in the uh, program, take a look at the edges or the ends of a lot of your willows that you might pass in wetlands or, or around ponds or any other areas where you might find willows that are within your eye level and look for these little structures. And then you will know that you are seeing the little shelter for the red spotted purple. And if you're not familiar with the red spotted purple and what it looks like, here it is. Uh, they in particular like to, um, especially the males will, will light a light on uh, poop, bird poop, uh, dog poop, coyote poop, uh, animals that may have been roadkill. And it's because they are taking chemicals off of these things to put in the sperm packet to pass on to the females. So here you have one that's uh, obviously nectaring on that wonderful little cone flower, but it's a beautiful, beautiful butterfly. Okay, let's get into the reptiles and talk about what they do to sort of hide and so that they won't be seen. Uh, the, the, the little brown snake is actually a little brown snake. It's, it's small. Most of the times you see them, they're really no bigger than the width of a pencil, a wooden pencil. They can climb trees very well and hide in the exfoliating bark. When they're on the ground or when you find them, this is what they look like, the lower left picture. And again, because snakes can be easily uh, predated upon by birds, 
they need to spend some time hiding or they will be a meal. Here's an Eastern garter snake on a very hot day in a stream, literally under the leaves in a stream to number one, cool down. And number two, if there's a predator nearby that they detect, they actually can go in the water to hide. Here's what you normally would see if you would see them on the forest floor uh, with the speckles on them. Uh, this one's got its tongue out, which is sort of a sensory organ that helps them determine what's around them. And then the black rat snake, which is the third set of photos. Very, very good tree climbers. Excellent, excellent snakes to have in and around your garden because they eat a lot of things that you don't necessarily want. They are very harmless. They are not gonna attack you or even, they're not interested in you in the least. Really beautiful when it first hatches out, you can see how shiny this one is, but here's one up in a tree. Uh, this picture was probably taken of this snake like 30 feet up. Um, and again, they will bask or they will hang out in trees like that. And they can eat all sorts of little things, but in particular, there are things that can eat them. So for example, here's our Northern water snake basking on some vegetation that's in a wetland. And again, think about what the predator is for snakes. And then you find this. So it's easy when you are being viewed from above, if you are not well hidden, a red tail hawk can come down, pick you up. Usually if you find hawks carrying snakes, it's because they're taking it to their nest site as opposed to feeding on it right there on the ground once they catch it. Same thing with our amphibians. Here's some bullfrogs hiding, or hiding, trying to blend in on some aquatic vegetation. And so you can see them here. Again, when they're not being hidden and you see them like this, then they become a prey item for things like gray blue herons, green herons, or any bitterns, any of the birds that will hang around the water's edge like that. Uh, they can also be, you know, picked up by red-shouldered hawks. I've seen red-shouldered hawks hopping along the edges of ponds looking for, you know, frogs. I've also seen, you know, minks will catch them a lot and carry them away. But again, remember that the, the angle at which they are being viewed is typically the way that they are colored in order to blend in. So blending into the background, and hopefully when you see this, you can sort of pick out what your what the focus is here. This is the caterpillar of the unicorn prominent moth. And as you can see where the head is on the left and the, and the tail end of it is on the right. But what's really cool about many of these types of caterpillars is they will remember in the world of moths and butterflies. Moths and butterflies taste with their feet, meaning that when they land on vegetation, they can tell by their feet and what their feet are feeling, whether or not their larva can feed on the plant. Hence the importance of laying their eggs on the correct plant. Hence the importance of having as many species of native plants in your yard, yards and gardens as you can, because this is the type of thing that you can attract. Now, what's really cool about this species and many in this group, for example, they will start feeding on the, the leaf tissue. And as this tissue turns brown, meaning that it is turning necrotic or looking dead because the chewing action of the caterpillar interrupts the fluid flow. And as a result, they make themselves this little tunnel or this little sidewalk, and then they use that sidewalk to parallel their body to it. And as you can see now, it's starting to feed on tissue that is still green. So by blending in, by laying in that little trough of the necrotic leaf tissue, that is what helps to hide it from a potential predator. And again, remember that most of our larvae, most of our caterpillars are fed on by birds. So again, that, that upper view or if they're on the bottom of the leaf, which this one is, many of the warblers can fly up and pull them down and feed on them from underneath. So again, wanting to look like something that doesn't look like that, you know, something they can feed on. Okay, again, more camouflage, camouflage in order to survive. So take a look at this picture, see what you might pick out. 
Let's get a little closer and even closer still. And there's our great horned owl, which is this, this shot was taken at the end of January. So it is nesting. We know that the great horned is our you know, earliest of our bird nesters for that reason. And again, when you are not well hidden or you are found out by the mobbing of crows, blue jays, chickadees, titmice, they, you know, they will incessantly try to get you to leave wherever they might be. So they dive bomb you and things like that. So being, being cryptically colored is very good. All right, let's take a look at this. Can you see anything in here? I'll give you a second or two to look. There's pointing out the eye, getting a little closer. And all you great birders will know what this is, but this is the American woodcock. So again, if we go back and we look at this, without knowing that's there, most of the times when you're out birding and you're walking through the woods and you're not necessarily on a trail, you walk into an area like this, obviously it'd be very difficult to see this woodcock sitting there. So again, having that pattern coloration on the back, again, along the side, uh, you know, very, very excellent for being situated or seated in and amongst a bunch of leaves that, you know, are dead leaves from the winter. Let's move on to our killdeer. And I'm sure you all have either seen or know about the broken wing display. When you get near a killdeer nest, the mom and the dad obviously try to lure you away from where the nest might be in order to keep you from predating it, no matter who you are, whether you're a raccoon or a person or a coyote or whatever. So again, you can see that here, you've got the nest here below it. Same thing here, the nest is back in here a little harder to see. But again, that action of the luring away is very important for this species. Because if not, once you get away from where the actual bird is, can you pick out the nest in here? There are the eggs. Obviously, we know that the killdeer like to lay their eggs in gravel areas, driveways, not always the best places, especially if, if it gets used later down, down the road to where people obviously can't see them. But again, speckled, rounded, looking like the gravel or looking like the whatever the substrate is. There's a little closer view looking from the top. And then as the eggs hatch, you could see, I mean, you can't get much cuter than this. Here's the face. Here's the little band across the top of the head. And this is the, was the first one to hatch. And now we've got two that have hatched. And now there are three that have hatched. And again, Killdeer are the type that actually can get up and start moving around quite easily after, not long after they have hatched. But that first day or so can be very critical. And one of their biggest predators, unfortunately, are raccoons because they can, you know, sense that they are there, that they are, are sort of at this point, it's not easy for them to get away. But once they're up and running, Take a look at this. You can obviously see the parent to the left, but again, there are the young. Railroad beds are often a favorite of them because of the all the rocks that are in there, the gravel that is placed in there along the side. And what you can't see is over here to the left, just off the picture, is the railroad track that, that the uh, nest was close to. But again, there's that little one next to the railroad tie. There's, you know, mom and dad still keep around them, herd them where they need to go, because obviously they cannot fly at this point. So they need to hide them in vegetation or whatever. And they speak to them and they tell them to scoot down in. And I remember when I was taking some of these shots, I really wasn't close to them at all. But mom and dad knew that something was there and they would make these little peeping noises and the little baby would just drop right down and which made it even harder to see. All right, take a look at this picture. See if anything stands out in there. Let's get a little closer and even closer. So this was a red bat that had decided to spend the day in one of my elderberry shrubs. And I was just out walking in the backyard and I come across this thing that I thought looked a little odd. 
So I got a little closer, took a, took a look, but you here you can see how he's all folded up. This is the underside. This is the side of lateral view. You could see his little claws that help it to hang onto vegetation. So red bats are not the communal bats that we typically know of, like the little brown and the big browns. So you can find these, especially as it gets closer to late summer and into fall because they, they will migrate and they may, may stop in your area. And again, for them, it's all about the cover. So they're looking for areas uh, where it might look overgrown. And there's, I've got a, a bunch of goldenrod, I've got a bunch of elderberry, I've got a bunch of native plants that they can hide in and amongst and spend the day roosting until they get ready to come out at night and either make the next leg of their migration or hunt or whatever. But again, there's the little face. So here's the little nose, ears. And again, this is all part of their wings that are folded up against their body, which help to make them not look so much like a bat when they're all folded up. Okay, getting into some other moth species. Now, I have really zoomed in on these so that you can see them. But if I were to back off with and ha show you the original shot, it would be very, very difficult for you to pick them out Number one, because they blend in so well. Number two, many of them, especially species that tend to look like leaves, they will sit right on the ground in the leaf litter. Also, you have them on tree bark, which these other three are on tree bark or dead, you know, dead trees that have that patterning that very much blends into what they look like. Here's another one, taking a closer look. And then again, and you could see there. So again, these moths, because they they are really at the bottom of the food chain. Birds are going to be their biggest predator. They really have to blend in, or they are, you know, they're going to be eaten. Okay, take a look at this one. What do you see here? Nice uh, blades on a sedge. Let's get a little closer. And you are looking at the caterpillar of the northern pearly eye butterfly. So again, by laying themselves in line with the sedges, which is part of what they eat, a lot of our groups of the what we call the browns, pearly eyes, wood nymphs, things like that, their caterpillars feed on sedges and grasses. But again, if this, for example, if this caterpillar was laying you know, perpendicular to these sedges, it would be very obvious that it was a caterpillar. But you could see the little red horns at the top of the head, which you can see, you know, better in the shot here. But again, look at the long lines on the body, which blend into the venation lines and the, and the lines on the sedge leaf. Again, purposely trying to hide. When it hatches out, it looks like that, which is the adult northern pearly eye. And again, when you see this in a woodland, it actually can be difficult to see because the browns and all of the coloration and the long lines help it to blend into bark or dead leaves, things like that. So now we're going to take a look at these wings in a different light. So the edges of quite a few of our species of butterflies and moths can resemble a caterpillar, which causes the birds to attack thinking that this is a larva or a caterpillar. And when they do that, it keeps them from attacking the front of the butterfly or the moth. And if they are able to attack it and they pull scales off or they pull sections of the wing off, the butterfly or the moth is able to still fly away because the important part, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen are still intact. So let's take a closer look at how much these can look like larva. So here we have our Cecropia moth in this upper left picture, but look how this looks like an eye and the back of a caterpillar, the, maybe the front of the caterpillar. Go down here to our Promethea. Again, these look like little legs. Some people think they look like teeth, but uh, or the roots of teeth. But again, you could see how to a bird, this could look like a caterpillar. Same thing here. The, the head of the caterpillar could be here. These little brown uh, ovals can look like legs. Same thing on our Milbert's tortoise shell. And again, it's all about the angle, the angle in which they're being viewed. But because the body blends in so well with the rest 
of the color scales closer to the body and in particular on our Milbert's tortoise shell because that overwinters as an adult, it wants the body to be dark and it wants the scales near to the body to be dark because if it comes out in January or February on a, on a degree day that's over 50, that dark coloration helps them to soak up the sun and heat up their body. Same thing with the morning cloak, which is down here in the lower right. That is also a butterfly that overwinters as a butterfly. Hence the dark color of the, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen, and the dark color of the wings nearest the body. But again, you can see how this pattern can look like a caterpillar hopefully throwing the birds off and having them attack them at a different point. Taking a look at this one, you may recognize this if you are a dragonfly or damselfly fan. This is the larva of a dragonfly that is in the water. I shot this through the water. It's in about, oh, four or five inches of water. If you're not aware, dragonflies and damselflies spend the bulk of their lives in the water as nymphs. So you can see the whole nymph here, six legs, the face is here, the eyes are here, the wings are nice and small at this point, all, all curled up basically. In At this point, this isn't ready to, to hatch out, but once the wing pads get longer and they're more than halfway down the abdomen of the nymph, then it'll be hatching out. Dragonfly and damselfly nymphs spend from one to seven years in the water before they hatch out into the flying adults that we all know and love. And the bigger the dragonfly, usually the longer the nymph is in the water. But as predators in the water, they are excellent. They love eating mosquito larvae and all kinds of other little aquatic insects. So when that nymph comes up out of the water, it's gonna climb onto a stem or a rock it's going to split its skin and the dragonfly is going to climb out. This is a wandering glider, which is what the previous shot was from. Yeah. Uh, the fluid that is in the thorax and the abdomen will actually drain into the veins that are in the wings so that the wings can expand to their full amount. And when you see a dragonfly or damselfly that have wings that look kind of like saran wrap, it's not good to touch them at that point because the wings are not ready, they're not solid, they're not uh, strong enough to be used for flight. They have to wait until they totally dry, which takes several hours after they have hatched out of the water. Uh, on nicer days or sunnier days, they tend to, to dry a little more quickly than they do on, on rainy days. Now, evasion, the act of escaping or avoiding to ward off predation. Here we have a dragonfly on the top and a damselfly on the bottom. And it's on a cattail leaf, so which is a broad flat leaf. And if that little uh, fork tail at the bottom decides to move, well, this pond hawk on the top is gonna grab it right out of the air and, and feed on it. So again, you got to know who your predators are, especially if they're in your own family, dragonflies and damselflies. So let's take a closer look here. What do you see in this picture? You might say, well, I see a bunch of leaves. Doesn't look like much. Take a look there. Let's take it a little bit closer. So here we have a dragonfly. You can see the wings. Kind of looks like the X-wing fighter. Uh, but look at how it is placing its face behind the stem. Um, maybe they're thinking that if they can't see us, we can't see them. But from a predatory standpoint, if you're looking straight on at that insect, it'd be very difficult to see that in order to feed on it. And again, dragonflies, basically their biggest predators are birds, especially the fly catchers, great cresteds, uh, any of those cedar wax wings, uh, any of those birds that fly along and around the wetlands because they know that they can get fine dragonfly. Uh, Phoebes love to eat them. But if you were, this is a calico pennant, and you, if you were to view it from above, you can see how it would be an easy target. But again, when you view it from different angles, by placing the face behind this stick, you could see how brightly colored the eyes are. And if the bird can see those eyes, then they know it's a dragonfly and they can feed upon it. Again, in that dragonfly damselfly world, 
You could see how they've placed the body of this uh, skimmer that is parallel to the little branch. Here's our great crested fly with the damsel. Here's a, you know, a bigger dragon eating a smaller damsel. And of course the swallows, the barn swallows, the tree swallows. Here's an Eastern amber wing being fed to a baby barn swallow, always on the move, always looking for these dragonflies and damselflies. So uh, once we were on a hike uh, at one of the areas in Lorraine County and came upon a damselfly that we happened to know would have been a county record, and while we were trying to get photos of it to show that it was a county record, um, a cedar waxwing came down, picked it right up off the stem that it was on and took it away. And that was the end of that county record. But again, when they are not moving, they're obviously harder to detect. When they are moving, they're easier to detect. And as they come out of the water to hatch into an adult, that's their most vulnerable of moments. So here we have trickery, and we're going to have a lot of uses of trickery. Here we have our West Virginia white butterfly, which is a globally imperiled species. We do have several areas within Northeast Ohio. Uh, some are in Cleveland Metro Park, some are on private property, some are uh, some are on other protected properties or preserves. But this is a globally imperiled butterfly because Number one, it has a very short flight period from mid-April to mid-May. It really can only lay its eggs on things in the mustard family, which includes our toothworts and things like that. However, it also includes garlic mustard. And unfortunately for them, this is a female and she's reaching her abdomen under this leaf to lay an egg on the underside of this toothwort. And this is what the egg looks like, obviously enlarged quite a bit. Uh, unfortunately for them, when they do lay their egg, when they land on a garlic mustard and they feel it with their feet, they know it's a mustard, so they lay their egg on it. Well, it's a sink for their caterpillars, their larvae, because once that egg hatches and the caterpillars start to eat the leaves of garlic mustard, the chemicals in the garlic mustard leaves will not allow them to go past their first instar or their first little growth period and they then do die. So that's another reason why you wanna pull garlic mustard wherever you find it, especially for this globally imperiled butterfly because we are losing habitat and we are losing their food, food plant for the caterpillars at an alarming rate. However, here we have our egg has hatched. So where's the egg? Well, the idea is the egg was here, but the first thing that most caterpillars will eat will be their egg, their egg shell, and for a number of reasons. Number one, it's got a lot of protein in it. It's their first meal. It's good food for them. But more importantly, number two is we have a whole group of wasps, bracketed wasps, other predatory wasps and insects that can detect an open egg shell. And therefore they will look around the area of the eggshell in order to predate the caterpillar. So by eating the eggshell, this little caterpillar then allows itself to live a little bit longer. Keep in mind that again, this is on the underside of this toothwort leaf, which is good. Butterflies and moths typically will lay their eggs on the underside. So they're not as easily seen by their bird predators. But again, by eating that eggshell, that makes a big difference for other predators that can find it. So let's get into our bug eaters. This again is more trickery, our pitcher plant and our round leaf sundew. Let's talk about the pitcher plant first. So the pitcher plant, remember that insects see in UV light, which is not how we see. So they are showing you these red or maroon lines that go down into the pitcher of the pitcher plant, here's the flower, front of the flower, back or side of the flower. But because the pitcher plant is a plant that actually gets its food from insects rather than from the nectar exchange, pollen exchange, like typical plants do, they are exhibiting these nectar trails, which to an ant, a bug, a bee, whatever, 
there's water in here. There's fluid inside this pitcher. And these little nectar trails really stand out like an eat at Joe's sign for the insect. The insect will follow this down into the fluid because they think, oh, it's nectar. I can drink this. This will all be great. Well, unfortunately, if you can see this little white haze across this leaf, these are little downward pointing hairs. So you can see these downward pointing hairs here. You could see the fluid inside of the pitcher, but you can also see this space where there's no downward pointing hairs. So here we have an ant who has fallen for the nectar trail and has gone down into the pitcher. Now it's trying to crawl out. So it has gotten, first it got past this really smooth area and it was able to hang on, but now it is in the area of the downward pointing hairs and it tries to crawl out, but unfortunately this particular ant did not make it. But this is the way of the trickery of this plant in order to get the insect to land in the water so that then it is assimilated, all of its body fluids are assimilated into the actual uh, pitcher of that plant. And that is what the food is for them to use it. Let's go on to our sundew. If you're not familiar with sundew, visit a bog or a fen that might have a boardwalk where you can see these plants. You have to get kind of down on your hands and knees to look at them because they're not very big. And the, of course, these shots are just really uh, enlarged so that you can see it. But at the end of each of these little fingers are these little blobs that look wet. And you can see by the flash on the camera how it, it looks like it's wet. Insects can see that. Here's a little insect right here. And again, because it looks wet, they think, oh, it's possibly nectar. So they will get themselves into that. So these on the left are the long arms on the outside. These on the bottom are the short arms on the inside. But again, they all end in that little knob. And what happens is here's our crane fly. It has crawled across this sundew. And for those of you of you know, the age when I was little, you could go to the Ben Franklin store and buy a little Venus fly trap in a cup and you'd stick your little flies in there and the Venus fly trap would close over. Well, the sundew is very similar to that. These are the leaves of the sundew. Now the sundew does have a flower and it's on a long skinny little stem and it's a little white flower that's very inconsequential. It's very, very small because again, once this the stickiness of this leaf attracts the insect and the insect gets into the center of that leaf, then it just closes over it like the Venus flytrap. And you could see here, this is actually a damselfly in here. Actually, there was two, it was a, a pair of damselflies, but it closes over it. And again, the, the leaf, the chemicals that are on the edges of these little knobs and uh, laying on the inside of the leaf, then help to assimilate the fluids of the insect into as food. So then we have this great little spring peeper who is hanging around in this habitat. And when the spring peeper, peepers first hatch out of their egg mass, and they're very tiny and they're crawling around on these sundews, more than a few of them actually can get into the center of a sundew and be caught in that same trap but the peeper is trying to catch or feed on the insects that are struggling to get out of the sundew. So sometimes it doesn't always work. Okay, let's get into our mimicry. And our, as we said before, the mimicry is the resemblance of one creature, the mimic to another, which is the model, so that a third observer, a possible predator is deceived. And our three main types are Batesian, Malarian, Wasmanian. Batesian mimicry occurs when the model is toxic and the mimic is harmless. Example, pipevine swallowtail, red spotted purple, and spicebush swallowtail. And then the malarian occurs when two toxic species co-evolve to look similar and share protection. Uh, one in particular, and we know this, and we are going to learn probably maybe some new information tonight, and maybe you all, all know this, but the monarch and the viceroy, that's kind of the one that most people know. And then the Wasmanian is where... The mimic resembles the host or the model in order to live within the same structure. 
So a lot of times you'll have beetles that'll closely resemble ants and the beetles will get into their ant colony. And because they look so similar, they can't, the other ants can't necessarily distinguish them. So they allow them in there and they can be fed and things like that. But let's start with our Batesian. So we have our pipevine swallowtail, which is the one at the top. Pipevine swallowtails feed on, the caterpillars feed on the vegetation of the Aristolochias or the pipevine. We have native pipevine, typically more found near central and southern Ohio than it's found up here, but we do have the pipevine, the, you know, you've seen the sort of the pipe that looks like a Meerschaum pipe. It's a very, more of an aggressive vine that a lot of times were planted on the porches of houses in many neighborhoods, for example, in Cleveland for many, many years, because back before you had air conditioning, you were looking for ways to shade your porch and they would grow pipe vine on the sides of the porches in order to you know, make it not so hot. But as the caterpillar feeds on the Aristolochia, the acids within them make them distasteful. So if you're a bird and you're feeding on the caterpillar of a pipe vine, it's not gonna taste very good. So when that pipe vine hatches into an adult butterfly, the head, the thorax and the abdomen also have those acids in them. So they don't taste all that great either. So in order to build off of that, the red spotted purple, which is our one at the left and our spice bush swallowtail, which is the one on the right, you can see how they look very similar to that pipe vine. And again, the red spotted purples and the spice bush mimic the color and the pattern to escape predation, but they are not, they don't carry any of the acids, for example, that the pipe vine does. So a bird could certainly be fooled into thinking that, okay, I'm, I'm gonna stay away from the spice bush and the red spotted. Now, again, these are all upper side views. Let's look at the lower sides. So again, having those that line of orange, so one of the ways people ask me a lot of times, how do you tell the underside of a pipe vine from a spice bush? Always remember that a pipe vine has one row or one arc of orange spots, whereas the spice bush have two with this lighter blue area in between. And again, being a swallowtail, you'll, you'll see the tails here and the tails here, but the red spotted purple mimics it very well by having one row of the orange spots. However, on the upper wing or the forewing of the red spotted purple, it also has orange where the pipe vine does not. So that's a way of telling them apart. We don't often see pipe vine up here in the northern part of Ohio unless you have the pipe vine plant. Um, Aristolochia durier is typically the one that people plant. Uh, and again, that's what the caterpillar can eat. So it makes, it makes a difference. Let's go into our Batesian mimicry with caterpillars. Those two on the left are the monarch, but if you look at the two on the right, those are the black swallowtail. Now, while they don't really, to us, look very similar, think if you're a bird and you see, you know, the yellow, the black striping, you know, whitish patterning also on it. Again, you can be deceptive and if you look like a monarch, most all birds that have ever tried a monarch won't try another one and they stay away from them. So again, you might be able to escape detection by looking similar. But if you look at the actual butterflies, of course, they don't look anything alike. Again, but it's in the caterpillar stage that you are most vulnerable to be you know, caught and eaten by a bird because there's a lot more mass to your body and you are, you know, a greater item to eat than the actual butterfly itself. Let's look at our spice bush swallowtail caterpillar and our green snake. So the green snake on the left is truly a green snake, but the little caterpillar on the right is the spice bush swallowtail. Keep in mind that this is not a real eye. This is not a real eye. The eyes are, the mouth is down here. So the eyes are down here. But again, you don't want to look like a nice fat juicy green caterpillar, you wanna look like a snakehead. That would be a good thing to look like, especially if you're trying to keep birds at bay. Let's go to the next one, take a look. When you see this, 
say you are a spice bush swallowtail caterpillar and say a bird lands on your leaf or near your leaf and you feel that motion, typically then you will pull your head back. You will sort of rise up to even more look like the face of a snake. So you could see these two eyes that are not really eyes. The eyes are down here, the mouth is down here. You don't normally see this unless you look underneath the caterpillar. Well, this caterpillar here, if you can see these little figure eight swirly uh, thread-like looking, that is the caterpillar spinning the silk onto the leaf in order to make its enclosure either for the night or getting ready to spin and make its uh, chrysalis for the winter. But you can see how it's using this, this the actual thread-like material comes out of its mouth there. Let's look over here. Here is our tiger swallowtail caterpillars. And again, these are not real eyes. Here are the eyes down here. Here's the mouth. You could see it eating the leaf. But again, you can see how it to a bird, it can look very, very similar to a snake. Again, hopefully they will not be fed upon by looking like that snake. Now we get into a whole group of eye spot mimicry and eye spots on wings mimic those from feared predators such as owls and foxes, believe it or not. So here's our polyphemus moth with the wings closed. Here's our polyphemus moths with the wings open. Part of the idea is if, say, a bird lands near this moth and the wings are closed, like we see here, it feels that vibration and immediately opens its wings, hoping that by flashing these eye spots, it will scare the predator. If you look at the shot on the right, you can see how from that angle that those can look like eyes. Let's develop that into what might be scaring them. So if you look at the eyes of the fox, you can see how it looks very similar, both in coloration and in the blending of it, and how even though the animal isn't sitting there that looks like a fox, it's enough of a flash to a bird that might be on the side of the tree or behind a branch that that's all it needs is that little bit of a, of a scare tactic that may make that bird not feed on it. Let's take a look at the io moth, the io moth with the wings closed. Again, this is a, one of the caterpillars that you don't want to handle because it's got a lot of spines on it and they get stuck in your hand and they hurt a lot. But again, when they detect a predator nearby or the leaf that they might be on is moving, they open the wings, they flash those eye spots. Let's transfer it to a different angle. And you can see how, again, when you turn that, if we go back, turn that moth basically upside down and take a look. You can see how this might look sort of like a bill in here. The two eyes look similar, even to the point where they have, you know, look at the, the rim that are part of the facial disc of the owl. And again, you'll think, well, how in the world can a bird think that that little moth looks like an owl? But again, it all it needs is that flash of the eye spots to potentially scare it away. We have a lot of other uh, butterflies and moths that have used this tactic where when the wings are closed, they look totally different than when the wings are open. And again, flashing those eye spots to potentially scare away a predator. Here's our Luna moth. Again, when the wings are closed, you see a couple eye spots up here, but when the wings are open all the way, you could start to see the wings on the hind wing, but then on the underside, uh, one of the kids, when I was showing a, a shot like this to a kid, they says, that looks like an elephant. There would be an elephant sitting in the tree because they thought this looked like the trunk down here. But again, looking at the way that they can flash those eye spots and, and change their pattern is what helps them to potentially get away. Now let's look at the tail and eye spot mimicry. And you get this with the swallowtails, you get this with the hair streak butterflies. And again, by having these little tails at the end and having these orange and black spots that can look like eyes, when they are feeding, they typically will have their head down and they will put their tails and those eye spots up. And you can see how this might look like a face. A lot of times you will find swallowtail butterflies, hair streak butterflies that are missing these tails and they are also missing these orange spots. And that's because a bird got a hold of them and sort of pecked at them 
down here, they were able to fly away because the head, the thorax, and the abdomen are up here. And for the most part, the wings are still intact. But again, by wiggling those little antenna that are not really antenna, but making them look like antenna, and flashing those eye spots, again, might be enough of a, of a scare tactic to get them to move. Here's our black swallowtail. Again, eye spots, tails, looking sort of suspect. And here's what happens. Here's our tiger swallowtail on the left. This is not the same tiger swallowtail, but you can see when a bird goes after it, this particular tiger swallowtail had both of its hind wings removed by a bird. And you can see that it can still fly, it can land on the plants, it can nectar. But this is another tactic that can keep them somewhat safe or at least aware, aware away from another predator. Going into our malarian mimicry, this is when two toxic species look similar and share protection. So we've always known for a long time that the viceroy, which is the butterfly on the right, looks very similar to the monarch, which is the butterfly on the left. Uh, the way you tell them apart is look on the hind wing, you see this extra line here on the viceroy that is not found on the monarch. But we always thought, well, okay, the monarch caterpillars feed on milkweed and milkweed have the cardenolides or the cardiac glycoside components in there in that little white sap that you see when you break you know break into a milkweed and it makes them distasteful and potentially poisonous to predators well then we find out here that because viceroys feed on willow and poplar they also have a chemical within them the phenolic glycosides they also can be distasteful and potentially poisonous, not the same chemical, but similar in composition that can make both of these, both as caterpillars and as butterflies, be distasteful or not be something that you wanna feed on. However, when you, when you look at them, you could see that both of the head, thorax and abdomen are dark and they still have the white spots on them. But let's take a look I don't have my caterpillar picture in here. Sorry about that. When we look at the caterpillar, and I'll show you one of the of the uh, viceroy a little bit later, but the viceroy caterpillar looks nothing like the monarch caterpillar, and it has a different sort of camouflage to it, which I will show you here in a few slides. So again, even though we always thought that the viceroy would be a fine one to eat, we now know that because of the plants that it feeds on, that it's not so tasteful. All right, we're going to go through a series here of hiding and hunting. Take a look at our goldenrod crab spider, which can actually change color to match the flower that it is on. So obviously you can see the goldenrod crab on the goldenrod. And here is a goldenrod crab spider in a common milkweed flower. What's interesting about this is this is the female. In the spider world, usually the females are always bigger than the males. Here's the male down here. See these two little legs? The male is actually underneath and below the female. But again, changing color to fit the substrate or whatever you're sitting on makes it really great because if you are a hide and watch or a hide and hunt species, this is what is important for you. If you don't blend in, you're not gonna be able to catch anything. Here we have our ambush bug. And you can see how when it sits in the center of that flower, it looks like a lot of these little pieces, parts that are in the flower. Let's get a little closer. And here's what it looks like. It's got these great front legs that sort of curl back. They kind of look a little bit like a, a thicker or bigger praying mantis leg because of how it can capture. But these, these actually, when they open, they look like little claws. This just kind of looks such like a prehistoric creature. There's the eye, there's the face. But sometimes if you're looking at your flowers, if you see a bee or a butterfly that isn't sitting quite right or isn't flying much or kind of is wiggling, here are two ambush bugs, one here and one down here that has caught this bee because the bee went for the flower. So by hiding in the flower, they are able to capture their prey. Here we have another one, the green lacewing. The lacewings are very good beneficial predators, both as in their larval stage and in their adult stage. But it's really cool. Here's the larva. These get these little pinchers on them, which are very good at catching things like aphids. But what they will do is they will pile 
stuff on their back. And by doing so, it looks like this from the top or it looks like this from the top, depending on what they're using for their, their camouflage. And in most cases, they are using aphid, aphid bodies. So when this lacewing larva gets onto a branch that has a bunch of woolly aphids on them, as they capture them, they'll pull off the wings, they'll pull off the fur. Let's go back one. You could see the wings on here. Here's a wing, here's a wing, here's a wing, mixed in with some of the fuzz of the woolly, and they will attach them to their body. So it's just like the old uh, coyote and the sheepdog Bugs Bunny cartoons where the coyote would dress up looking like the sheepdog and vice versa. And then again, crawling along within the aphids, the aphids cannot tell that it's a predator. And of course, then they can get in there and feed all day long on these aphids. Here is the adult lacewing on the lower left. And that is a very wonderful predator on its own. They've got gorgeous, gorgeous eyes. If you ever get to see a green lacewing up close, I highly recommend looking at the eyes. Getting into our amphibians. Remember in nature, if it's red, it's for a reason. Here's a garter snake trying to eat a northern red salamander and it got it quite a bit of the way down. You could see it's little started off here. This is the head up here. It's keep moving it down and then all of a sudden, it spit it back out because again, a lot of our amphibians have chemicals that they can emit from their skin, especially when they're being bothered by a predator, which then in most cases will make them drop, drop the salamander, drop the newt, whatever. And again, because they can use that chemical. So it wasn't too much the worse for wear. Here's our little spring peeper hiding in a spider web. This one in particular ate the spider first, then backed into the spider web with the face at the opening of the hole. And as little creatures would come by, it could feed on it. So that was a way of hiding where they weren't easily caught from above because if a bird tried to get it or whatever, it might get its feet tangled in the web. Changing colors to match habitat like we saw before. Here's our gray tree frog. Here it is gray because it's on a, in a little cavity in a, in a gray barked tree. Here then as it goes on to some wetland plants, you could see how it can change its color. Here it's in the stage of changing its color. This one in particular had hopped from a trunk of a gray tree onto this vegetation in a wetland. And you can see how it's starting to turn green, but part of it is still gray. It can take anywhere from, 10 to 20 minutes or so to, to blend in better than not blending in. And again, it's part of the camouflage, part of the way that it doesn't get eaten. So take a look here. Let's get a little closer. Let's get a little closer. And one more. So what you're seeing, oops, sorry. What you're seeing is here was a gray tree frog hiding in this little cavity during the day hiding, 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 and that's it. That's just sitting in there. If it was out sitting where it could easily be seen, it would be a meal. So the, the cryptic coloration really pays off. This is one of the coolest stories. Um, if you read about it, it's, it's pretty amazing. But this is our silver spotted skipper. This is one of our most common uh, summertime butterflies. You see it a lot. It's our biggest skipper, but it's got this little white patch on it. Hence the name silver spotted skipper. When the wings are closed, it's more often recognized. When the wings are open, it's not as often recognized because you don't see the silver spot. Here's the egg. So the female comes, she lays her egg on the particular plant that she likes to do that with because she knows her caterpillar will be able to eat it. And when the caterpillar grows up and gets through all of its instars, this is a full grown caterpillar. And you can see that it's got this, you know, great looking brown face, sort of Cleveland brown colors, uh, orange feet. But you see the silk on the side of this leaf. It is starting to stitch together the leaf to make its little enclosure, whether it's ready to hide for the night or potentially ready to make its chrysalis. So 
in this, again, as we talked about in the world of Lepidoptera, and we talked about it a little bit with our caterpillar that ate its little eggshell first, this particular species, we know that the braconid wasps and the other smaller predatory wasps can typically find their prey because they can detect the smell from the frass or the caterpillar poop. So if you're a caterpillar and you, you emit your frass or your caterpillar poop and it's right there next to your body, that's just like a, a sign saying, come on over here, wasp. I and predatory wasps, don't think of it in terms of yellow jackets, um, regular wasps. These are smaller, darker wasps that will lay their eggs inside of the caterpillar. So by having the frass near the caterpillar, the wasp can detect where the caterpillar might be because it can see, find and search around the frass. Well, this particular species actually can fire its frass out of its body to the, to the length of like four feet, 40 times its body length, if not more, and it lands somewhere on the forest floor. And when the braconid wasp comes along after it, finds it, it searches around the frass for the caterpillar, but it won't find it because that caterpillar had launched it from such a long distance away in the insect world at long distance, that that's one of the ways that it can save itself from becoming um, a meal ticket for the predatory wasps, which then, if it finds the caterpillar, lays its eggs inside the caterpillar. And when its larva hatches out, it eats that caterpillar from the inside out. So let's go back to our talking about of other ways of not being detected. We have a whole group of moths and caterpillars that look like crap or bird poop or looking like other types of bird poop. So for example, the top two are moths. This one on the right, the upper right is actually called the bird poop moth because it looks like bird poop sitting on a leaf. The bottom two, here's the caterpillar of the viceroy. So it doesn't need to mimic the caterpillar of the monarch because it mimics bird poop. And when it's sitting there eating and you see this as a bird's eye view, this is not gonna look like something you wanna eat because it looks like bird poop. Here's our giant swallowtail on the lower right. And again, because it doesn't look like a big long straight caterpillar and it's got this big white end to it. If you're familiar with turkey, turkey droppings, a lot of times when you see turkey droppings, one end of the turkey dropping looks like a big sort of white mass. But again, as that giant swallowtail caterpillar gets larger, it's gonna change in color. But when it's small and, and vulnerable, it tends to look like bird poop. And hence, that's hopefully the way that it will escape being eaten. So here's another one that is a way that, that the parents try to keep the eggs from being predated. Um, these are goldenrod leaf miner beetles. This is the female here. She is laying the eggs. This is the male, again, in the beetle world, Usually the male and the female, the females are bigger than the males. And when they mate, the males are on the backs of the females. But you can see how she laid her eggs here. And you could see that she's got her little end of her abdomen with this little hole that's open. And she actually spreads the feces on top of the eggs before she leaves where the eggs are. And by doing so, that helps those eggs to be protected in their egg stage until they hatch and then become a little larva and then they'll they'll feed on the plant. But how cool is it that they know enough or have it within their DNA that they need to lay that, you know, that little line of of poop <laughs> across and down the edges of the eggs in order to protect them. So remember in nature they see us long before we see them. Red fox, upper left, box turtle, middle, barred owl on the right, blue fronted dancer, damselfly on the left. There's our gray tree frog blending in very nicely to its skunk cabbage leaf and our morning cloak butterfly. So when possible, save the old dead and dying trees. I just love this lithograph because it's just, it's from 1865, but it's just cool because it just shows you all the different ways that you know a tree could be used 
But again, habitats abound. Search for these things that look different or look unusual. That's the way that you might be able to find things that are very camouflaged in nature. And with that said, that's the end of the show. So I'm ready for questions. Oops. Go back. Feel free to unmute yourself and ask Judy any questions you have, please. Well, Judy, I think I'll start off. Okay. Um, you mentioned at one time that the 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 caterpillars will start to come out at fifty degrees. Um, December was a pretty warm December. Did did you notice any caterpillars? The well, typically the the butterflies. The, okay, the butterflies will Sorry. be the ones that will come out. So. Not usually so much in December, but it's more like in January and February because we still can have some pretty, uh, you know, warm weather or warmish weather. You will start to notice them now. In fact, this last, uh, actually at the end of December and people were noticing that we were having temperatures in the 60s, they were seeing morning cloaks mm. and they were seeing, um, uh, the commas and the question mark. So there, there were some that were coming out. Then they go right back in as it gets cold, and then they continue to be in their hibernative stage. But definitely they will come out because it's warm. They can warm up their body by either sitting on the ground. Typically, you'll see morning cloaks sitting on the ground so that their dark wings next to their head, thorax, and abdomen can warm up and then that helps to uh, keep their body warm. And then as the temperature drops more toward the evening, they will fly back into, for example, when you see this little tree on the left here, any of these little spots that are open or for example, under uh, shagbark hickories or the bark on a lot of our ash trees that are now sort of exfoliating off and you see the trunk underneath, they can hide up under that bark for the winter and spend the winter like that. Well, I, there's a couple of comments on the chat also that people are saying, you know, terrific program, fantastic photos for interesting subject matter. Thank you for the great thank you. presentation. And thank you, Judy, for a great presentation. So you're, you're being enjoyed. <laughs> Thank you very much. And Thank you. Just everybody get out there and start looking for all this cool stuff because you can, you can be finding chrysalises and, and cocoons and things like that right now. And as was mentioned earlier, how much easier it is to see things when the leaves are off the trees. So get out there. And when you're on your bird, your next bird walk, while you're looking for the birds, you might stumble across some of these things that we talked about this evening. Wonderful. Thank you, Judy. Any more? Thank you. Any more questions out there from our participants? Oh, I think we're done. All righty. Okay. So thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Michelle, do we have any more slides on our slide deck? No, we yeah. are done. Thank okay. you. Well, I want to thank everybody for participating and for, for coming to listen to Judy. And um, jo please join us next month on February 1st for our next meeting. We look forward to seeing you all then. Thank you, everybody. Happy New Year, everybody. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye.